So, um, yeah, retrospective or prospective study, are we going to take data from our PACS database or are we going to scan patients specifically for this study? Then you do the imaging, then you do the interpretation by experienced radiologists, they are often called, uh, yeah, with their uh, two letters, whatever, 14 years experience, blah, blah, blah. And then, um, of course, in radiology, you have eyeballing of the data, really looking at the data and making a report. Uh, and sometimes they use, I call them semi-quantitative measurements. For instance, um, uh, volumes or, or uh, um, um, uh, what do you call it, oppervlak, uh, areas, um, just measured on the PAC system with very simple uh, tools. And then correlation of these data with other data, and these data can be retrieved from the electronic health record, like blood samples or clinical data or other uh, stuff that's available in the hospital uh, database. Do some uh, statistics and then come to a con conclusion. And in the end, you can update your guidelines or validate your technique, etc. Uh, so this is a, a typical example or one from our hospital. So you can see this was a retrospective study. So we just went to the PACS system, got all the data from patients um, in a certain time range with a certain uh, illness. And then, uh, yeah, you see here, uh, there's the two radiologists, 14 years of experience and one with 13 years of experience. Uh, they did some analysis and then there's some statistics in the end. This is very typical workflow for uh, research in radiology. And in the end, you get a new uh, guideline. So, um, yeah, to take home, um, radiology research uh, may be very different from traditional research because you don't do uh, an experiment. And it's very important to evaluate current techniques or compare techniques uh, with each other and validate them for clinical use. So how does a radiology department work? Um, if you go through this cycle, this is an extremely important cycle in the hospital. As I said, it's a little bit like a factory. Uh, so you need a lot of processes and all these processes need to be described and followed in the hospital. So you go from the registration of the patient, um, then the uh, hospital information system that actually um, uh, holds all the data about this patient. So, uh, uh, yeah, disease information, maybe results from previous tests. Um, then it goes into the radiology information system, the RES, and there um, you can, yeah, the patient gets scheduled for the MRI scan. The scan is performed. And then it goes to this uh, database, the PAX da database, and then the radiologist is at this workstation uh, looking at the images and making a, a report. Uh, and all this is done uh, to generate some evidence. So that's a, a key important step in, in the radiology workflow is you need to combine uh, the health records from the patient and the previous data with your images and, your, uh, and make some kind of uh, decision about what needs to happen for this patient. Um, of course, if something goes wrong in this cycle or something is not validated, like in the previous talk, if you have different analysis methods and every analysis method give a different results, yeah, for a patient that needs to undergo brain surgery, that's uh, not a very good case. Uh, we don't want this to happen. So everything needs to be validated. Um, and then yeah, if you go to research, what does a radiologist need for research? There's this whole cycle, uh, this workflow cycle. And then you can go to image analysis, uh, can be open source, but often then you go to non-DICOM applications, so you have to go to NIFTY. Or for instance, uh, at our hospital, we work with Siemens. We have a single VIA, which is a data analysis tool, which is integrated within our whole uh, ecosystem. And it, um, then you stay in your DICOM framework. I will come back to DICOM uh, later on. Um, of course, you need some kind of annotation management uh, system. 
And usually this is done by pen and paper. So we just look at the patient, look at the image, and then write down something about the patient, and this is collected in this way. Statistical tools, copy values from the PAC system by hand to Excel, and then even going to some statistical person to have your data analysis, uh, analyzed, etc. Uh, and then, of course, you have the uh, data sharing. Um, data sharing is also extremely important, but very difficult uh, from a PAX system to go to other applications. For instance, if you go to stereotactic surgery, you have to somehow get your data from the PAX, which is in DICOM, in your uh, surgery system. Uh, but this may not accept DICOM images, and then you get into problems. Uh, even if you go from one department to the other, if you go to radiotherapy, you sometimes have to resort to USB or CD. Uh, uh, Multi-center studies, the same <coughs> big problem. You have to get your data from your PAC system into some kind of other system. Uh, and for clinical trials, this uh, is also, uh, uh, of course, a very... Uh, tedious uh, uh, process and yeah, prone to errors. That's uh, basically what can happen. Um, so this workflow system is the cornerstone of radiology. The everything revolves about this workflow, but it's not designed for research. And it's, um, yeah, if you want to do research, you have to do some other stuff. Um, so if you want to do radi uh, research in radiology, uh, PAX is not designed for this, um, and it relies on DICOM um, for the interoperability between your acquisition modality and your hardware. And this interoperability is very important. So every device needs to be able to communicate with PAX uh, uh, to know that there is a unique identifier for this patient and that you can follow this patient through the whole uh, care system. Um, also, this link with the uh, electronic health record is essential. Um, of course, if you don't have that, then you have a big problem. Um, and then we come to, I think, one of the main reasons why we don't have a lot of open source tools yet in the hospital is traceability. So we need to be able to follow a patient over time. Even if he had an MRI scan 10 years ago, we should be able to find this and retrieve it. Uh, and also, if data goes outside of the PAC system, it somehow needs to get back into the PAC system and be linked to that uh, patient. So that's extremely important. Uh, and then, yeah, also the DICOM is not designed for image processing. That's, uh, I think, a, a key uh, a point as well. It was never designed uh, to go into image analysis uh, tools, but it was designed for traceability. So. Um, and then, yeah, access to raw DICOM. I don't know if every, anybody has tried to get raw DICOM files from your PAC system. That's a really pain in the ass. Um, your header is changed. Everything changes once it goes to the PAC system. So if you really want to do analyses, you ha often have to get the data directly from the, the scanner instead of going through the PAC uh, system. Um, so then I want to uh, highlight some problems that exist in radiology with non-DICOM applications. I think you can already feel what the problem is. But yeah, we have to deal with this situation anyway because we have a lot of non-DICOM applications in the hospital. Um, yeah, well, you can read it yourself, but there are many. Uh, so this PAC system was designed only for radiology review and once you need to go outside of uh, to other applications, you have to manually transfer to uh, your data and, of course, traceability is broken. Um, I don't want to raise the GDPR discussion <laughs> a bit more because that's, uh, for a hospital, also really, really a big problem. Um, so once we go outside of the hospital or, and we have to go to GDPR, anonymized data, yeah, we can't get the link with the patient. Um, yeah, that's... Uh, um, then, of course, every piece of software uh, which is used for uh, uh, clinical purposes has to be FDA or CE labeled. Um, that's also why it's so expensive and so, uh, yeah, where you have a high cost of maintenance because this, this is really a, 
uh, a very uh, tedious process, I think. Um, but in the end, if you go to open source software, you can also use it because the radiologist in the end always needs to decide whether he trusts the results or not. So in the practice, not a real big problem. And I found this a uh, really a nice imaging or uh, image of what is DICOM versus NIFTY. Um, so DICOM was really designed as a big uh, yeah, ecosystem where you can really easily transfer and op images from one uh, thing to the other. But NIFTY is yeah, designed for only one thing and it's very difficult uh, for NIFTY data to, to exist in a hospital uh, environment. Um, yeah, so I've gone over this whole uh, uh, process and um, yeah, when looking for open source alternatives, actually they do exist, um, but um, they are, if you go and look for, uh, for instance, hospital information systems or radiology information systems, you find them open source, um, but I got the impression that they are designed uh, mainly for uh, use in, in um, uh, second or third world countries with, where they don't have the money to invest in uh, uh, PACs uh, or other systems. But they exist. Um, you have uh, hospital information systems, you have uh, open source PACs like systems. And of course, if you go to the review workstation, you have uh, various tools which are open source or free to use. Uh, um, uh, tools. But then, yeah, we go to the question, why don't we use them in the hospital? Um, that's the biggest problem, is somebody has to connect all these uh, open source tools because they are not offered as a single package. You have to connect them yourself. Um, and this is uh, a task that's um, then passed down to the PAX manager, uh, which, yeah, it's very complicated to get all these tools doing exactly what you want. Um, and then we come to actually our PAX engineer. I've asked him for some advice and what's the, the key issue for uh, medical software or software in radiology, that's maintenance. Somebody has to do the maintenance and somebody has to make sure that everything keeps running and if there's any downtime that it's fixed within uh, let's say one hour, very short time window. Um, and that's the main reason why you go to a commercial company, uh, because they really can ensure all this maintenance. They can also do the installation, uh, follow up. If there are any problems, then you can always go to this company. And for open source tools, this is uh, not often uh, the case. Uh, of course, also liability, like I said, for this FDA and CE approval. Uh, what if there's a mistake or there's some error in the software? Who's liable? If you go to an open source community, there's no real person which you can go to and say, well, you're liable for this error in the software. And if you have a company, of course, that's a, a, a different uh, story. Same holds for accountability, of course. And one very important point is also life cycle of your software. So um, if you work with open source, you're not, you don't have a, at least that's my impression, maybe you have different uh, uh, opinions. There's a not a stable uh, uh, life cycle of, your, uh, of the software. So um, we know that if we have a stable system within our hospital, it will remain stable. And if you get an update, it's tested, it's validated, um, and you can go to the company if something is wrong. Uh, and we also know that these updates occur within a specified time frame. Um, and to be honest, you know, it's also not easy to, for instance, do an upgrade of your PAC system. I know that this takes one or two years of preparation for our engineers to get everything in place. We recently moved to a new version and that's really, uh, uh, yeah, like five to ten people working there on, on that uh, Professional support, I've already mentioned, and documentation, that's a very important um, beside legal uh, regulations. And also, I think a very uh, interesting topic uh, is it has to fit in the clinical workflow. So if you have designed your open source tool and you think it's very nice and it works and blah, 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 uh, it needs to work within the f workflow because if a radiologist 
sometimes they only have a couple of minutes to look at uh, your data and if they have to open a different application on a different computer then they already say well I won't do it because that takes too much time everything has to fit within their um, workstation or ecosystem that they work in uh, of course it's not all uh, bad about uh, open software but um, we all know, or at least in a hospital environment, you always need other tools. So you can't work, uh, all do all, everything you want within the PAX uh, uh, environment. There are always uh, problems, or you need to go to other software. And we often fix this with custom scripts and, and uh, um, uh, yeah, on the spot workarounds, whatever. Um, but it's not the ideal situation. In an ideal situation, you want to have some kind of system that can easily export DICOM images to another uh, system where you can do your analyses or research. Um, and these are the specialized processes, of course, uh, that are other than the daily workflow, uh, looking at images and generating a report for the patient. If you do want to do something else, you need uh, different uh, things. So, yeah, what you need is actually some kind of imaging buffer. I've already said this. Uh, need some kind of second storage uh, where you can uh, get data from outside of the clinical workflow. You need anonymization. Uh, this is to be discussed, let's say. Um, it's not always an advantage to anonymize your data. Um, getting data out of the packs to software and also be able to share them with other people, maybe other doctors outside of your hospital through the internet. And then, of course, um, what the PAC system is also not designed to do is to do automated stuff, automated pre-processing, automated whatever analyses. Um, and you need kind of some kind of system that uh, can do this. And yeah, it would be very nice if you had a system that could exchange data with other hospitals or with clinical studies, pharmaceutical firms, whatever. Um, this basically summarizes the big problem of sharing data. Um, at the moment, this is doable. You can share data with other uh, centers, uh, but very time consuming and um, like I said, this traceability that is key is often lost in this whole process. Um, I've got this slide from Sebastian Jodogne. I don't really know how to uh, uh, pronounce the name. But I've added myself the attitude in the medical world towards sharing data. I think this is also something um, uh, that doctors are not used to, let's say it like this, to share their data with their patient with their special disease and to somehow give away they see it as giveawaying their data to others to also work on this patient yeah uh, it's a very still a uh, hierarchical and egocentric wor world sometimes in hospitals so this is a i think a, a, yeah one problem that needs to be attacked as well um well actually when looking for material for this presentation, I found that there is some kind of system that can work next to the PAX, and it's called Orthanc. Um, it's actually built as a, yeah, um, as a system where you can really easily share uh, data with other uh, centers, and you can also um, do all the tasks uh, outside of the PAX system, like uh, scripting and interfacing with uh, with other software, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I've just found this software. I've not yet used it, so I don't know if it really works. But uh, this seems to be one of the solutions. Uh, it's an open source uh, system um, that can maybe uh, fix uh, some of the issues that we have in research in radiology. Um, of course, when you go to such a system, there are also drawbacks. <laughs> Again, this workflow, that's really important. If you get any problem with this workflow, then your solution is failed and the doctor will immediately say, I don't want to use it, go home. Uh, data storage limitations. Of course, a uh, professional PAC system works also with dedicated hardware that's validated, that has a stable uptime, whatever, redundancies, uh, all these things. 
and uh, professional um, PAC systems also provide all the hardware needed to run your system. And of course, if you go to an open source system, install your own server, yeah, you never know what the reliability is of the hard disks and everything. Um, yeah, all the data processing, especially migration. Um, if you move from one system to another system, you have to make sure that you have all the data from all the patients and that it moves to the new system. Security, of course, we can always go to our commercial vendor and say, well, your security is not okay, and they have to fix it. But if you have an open source, uh, to who are you going to go if you have any security concerns? Or who can you uh, yeah, get uh, accountable for, for security? Um, and yeah, maybe one thing I didn't touch upon yet is the costs. Uh, people might think that um, open source is, uh, has a lower cost than, than closed or commercial products. But actually, that might not be true. Um, like I said, I asked our PAX engineer for some information, and he said, well, if you, you can go to open source, there's actually no real problem with that, going to open source, but then you need to hire five PAX engineers full time. So, um, and this cost is maybe higher than acquiring a license for a commercial uh, product. Um, and also, yeah, limited functionality. So, um, the other thing that came out, this is actually a survey of uh, 124 PAX professionals, is uh, very interesting, something I also found uh, during preparing for these talks, that actually the functionality of your PAX system could be improved with the use of open standards for interoperability and system integration. So, um, um, yeah, of course, all your devices in your... Uh, how much time do I have left? Two minutes. Okay, then I'll go over. The other stuff is boring anyway, so <laughs> but open standards. Uh, um, so open standards for healthcare. Uh, I didn't even know uh, that these exist, but they are actually very important. So there is this one institution called Integrating the Healthcare Enterprise, EHA, and they make sure that your device uh, can communicate with the PAC system and the other way around. And they provide all the standards. I will go over this very quickly. They provide all the standards you need to have your device communicating with other devices or your software communicating with PAC software. So if you want to go to uh, open source application and you want to make sure, well, can it work within a hospital environment, I would recommend going to IEHAE uh, um, and getting in contact with them. Actually, very conveniently, my colleague is in the European board of this uh, authority. Um, and they provide all the standards they need, and they even uh, uh, organize hackathons or connectathons, they call them, uh, to connect your software with uh, the other world of, uh, in the hospital. Um, I had one example. So we do patient fMRI analysis with SPM in our hospital because the, the tools that are used, uh, provided from Siemens, they just don't perform as we like. So in, we implemented our own SPM stuff. But of course, there are liabilities. And the, in this case, the radiology, radiologist himself decides, I like this and I trust this. So uh, that's it. So uh, we need in radiology, especially traceability of data. That's the key thing. So if we lose this in going through open source or other analysis packages, then yeah, it's no use for us. And standards for data exchange are really important if we go to, uh, to outside of the PAC system, for instance. Thank you. That's it. Okay, I'm gonna take some minutes for questions and discussions. We want to start, comments, anything? I can start. Um, so I'm wondering if <clears throat> I forgot what the graph looks like of your workflow, but I remember there was a scanner there. 
Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering if you think there's room for vendors themselves to build in open-ish tools to help, or do you think that could lead to more problems because it's just another standard? Yeah. Like, like would it make sense for vendors to have like a plugin for certain types of open standards for data sharing or interoperability? Yeah. And do you think that's a good idea? I would love that actually, yeah, because the the scanner at the moment is a closed box mainly. Um, it would be, especially for testing new stuff. Uh, uh, sometimes we have to deal with so many problems if we want to, for instance, a radiologist has seen something on a conference, a uh, new uh, technique, MRI technique, and before we can get this on the scanner, you have to get uh, agreements with the other parties, You have to, or you have to wait if it's a product and it costs 50,000 euros to install, and it may not be worth it. And if you would have some kind of system where you can test uh, sequences or, or maybe analysis post-processing somehow on the scanner itself. Um, I'm not talking about production, like really scanning patients. I think this is a subject that has to stay with the vendors, also for this FDA labeling and CE and whatever. But certainly for testing things and trying out new, uh, that would be very nice if you would have some kind of open standard. And I think another very important thing is standardization of imaging. If you somehow, we need to go to more standardized imaging. I mean, if you go from a Philips to a Siemens scanner, there's always differences in data quality between the two scanners or the way the data is acquired. And if we would have an open standard for <coughs> somehow being able to standardize imaging, that would be very helpful, I think. That's, uh, Uh, similar theme to Stefan, but slightly more cynical. Do the do the vendors have an incentive to move towards the open standards you're talking about? And if they don't have an incentive, are they deliberately dragging their feet? Are they blocking the implementation of this to some degree? Um, well, I can't look into the, the vendors' heads, of course, but I've not yet seen any open. And uh, yeah, of course, there's a lot of money involved. Uh, you often don't know why a sequen sequence has to be so expensive. I mean, they often that's also a problem I have. They take often research that's in the open, so a publication, and then implement it, and then it becomes a very expensive product. So I don't know why this has to be so expensive, but um, of course, getting it FDA labeled takes a lot of time and energy and money. But um, yeah, I, I don't know if the vendors are moving towards any open standards at the moment. Yeah. But even adding to that, just technically, the DICOM headers, for instance, contain often private yeah. information, which is sometimes necessary yeah. to do your processing, and, and they are really not willing to, to uh, yeah. open this up. Yeah. And this is a, a, b a big issue, and I think this should be resolved. Yeah. Um, also, the DICOM um, standards, super complex yeah. um, so it's really hard to deal with all flavors of DICOM and to have some kind like like the same with bits bits is it's much less complex but it's even now very hard to maintain and and DICOM is, is a thousand times more more complex so even technically it's it's a very hard thing to to have open source but maybe just two or three developers working on this Maybe just a comment. Um, I, don't, I don't see really a conflict between co commercial and open source. I mean, it always sounds as if open source open source is a license, basically, of the software, and doesn't mean really that there are companies which make money out of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see that exp um, if you look at other fields of software development, databases, or uh, um, programming languages. I'm not aware of any kind of database uh, or programming language that was developed in the last 10 or 20 years which was not open source. Mm -hmm. So it's actually, there are big companies, just to name one, Google, I mean, which they basically make all their money off yeah. uh, with open source. So um, it's true that uh, in the medical world is that's very protective and we're running behind that, but in general, I would be surprised, actually, if in 20 years there will be still some companies which make money with closed source. 
Yeah, actually, that's also maybe I was wrong in my. But uh, I'm I'm not thinking. Actually, open source can be very beneficial. But like I said, if you go to open source, there needs to be some company that maintains it. Yeah, that's that's I think now the the biggest problem. You don't have a company like Red Hat or whatever. Yeah, if you yeah. I think we don't need to have a company actually because all the data production like the main problem is like the data and the maintaining in a pro in a protocol like in a protocol way I think I think in physics like in high energy physics they are already having that like in sense they have a big data and they have standard structure and they are working everything in open source so if we get ideas from them and implement in medical things mm -hmm. it's easier I think mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's more a question about liability and yeah, legal yeah. issues. Who is responsible if something is wrong? That's the, the big question. And who can solve the problem fast? <laughs> Sometimes you need only, yeah, within one hour it needs to be solved. There's a medical doctor. <laughs> the discussion between DICOM and Nifty is, of course, interesting because here we all love Nifty probably and hate DICOM. But if you go to the ISRM, then there are actually people that are trying to put parametric maps inside DICOMs. Yeah. It's called the DICOM parametric uh, standard. Yeah. And they would think, why are you creating bits? We have a standard already. Yeah, it's called DICOM. I mean, not, well, we, not we your PAC system doesn't always support this. That's the... Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. Hey, the hospital would ways, like to stay same, in DICOM. Uh, yeah. Same answer. And I think actually we should merge all the... Yeah. Or at least have a, a common it's beds. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Any more question? No. Um, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask one. Um, you mentioned that, for example, during your workflow, you have sort of validation is sort of built in, into the workflow. I guess does that involve that, um, like sort of two questions sort of. Do you mean, for example, quality control? And if, and, and, or if it's not, what, what do you mean by validation? And could you give us some examples? Because I know that, for example, in your imaging research, quality control or validation is not something that is taught. Like it's, it, we hear about it, but we, we, we have too few examples of what that could look like. So could you sort of tell us more about what it looks like from the clinical perspective, for example? Yeah, I think validation is a different concept in the medical world. So. I, what you're pointing at is probably with phantoms and other kind of data or, yeah, some kind of quality. But I think validation in the medical world is more like somebody published a paper and says, well, on this T1 image, I will always see uh, this kind of disease. But then it needs to, of course, be tested on a larger cohort and validated against much more patients with maybe a different uh, disease states. I think that's the validation in the, in the medical world. Yeah.